Confusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we express weird and wonderful science into your rejuvenated brain. I'm Ian Wolf. This week, the fresh scientists talk about electric cars, tuberculosis, and who pink off, in the time it takes for a sparkler to burn down. But first up, more immortal mice. Forever young? Professor David Sinclair, an Australian working at Harvard University, claims to have restored youth to old mice, and then used the same drug to cure blindness from optic nerve damage in other mice. Professor Sinclair has a new theory of ageing based on methylation markings on DNA. The old theory is that these markings change as we age, merely showing our age. David Sinclair's theory is that the clock is part of the ageing, and if you wind the clock backwards, you actually reverse ageing. If you reset the markings to a younger state, then the DNA is expressed as it was when you were young. He believes that many of the diseases of old age are caused by methylation marking, causing DNA to express the proteins wrongly and build new cells in a bad way. He's been well known for his previous work on resveratrol, found in red wine and chocolate, and NMN nicotinamide mononucleotide that slow ageing in mice. In 2006, Kazutoshi Takahashi and Shinya Yamanaka discovered that we can induce pluripotent stem cells that can become any kind of cell, just like embryonic stem cells, but using adult body cells instead, by adding four transcription factor genes that encode OCT4, SOX2, KLF4 and c However, if you just put that mixture in the body, you cause cancer. David Sinclair found that if you cut out just one of the factors in the cocktail, then not only do you avoid causing cancer, but you can induce cells to revert to a younger state. He has some of those running mouse videos that are becoming the standard for anti-aging treatment presentations. Two mice, born on the same day, are running side by side on separate treadmills. One mouse has been treated with the new drug cocktail, and one has not. The treated mouse looks younger and easily sprints along, while the old mouse slows and gets exhausted. Intriguingly, the treated old mouse also seems to have more stamina than an actually young mouse. Glaucoma is an eye disease where the fluid in an eye increases without draining properly, causing pressure in the eye that damages the optic nerve, causing loss of vision. For people suffering glaucoma, we can lower the pressure with drugs and surgery, but we currently don't have any way to repair the optic nerve and restore the sight that people have lost. David Sinclair took mice that had retinal damage from pressure, similar to the damage caused by glaucoma, and then injected his rejuvenation cocktail into their optic nerve. The nerve repaired itself and grew back up to the brain. David Sinclair's lab showed moving patterns to two mice with optic nerve damage, one treated and one untreated. The treated mouse moved its head to follow the movement, while the untreated mouse did not. We don't know how much vision was restored in this early experiment. David Sinclair estimates perhaps 50%. He's also rejuvenated the optic nerves in elderly mice to restore their sight to youthful levels. David Sinclair was famous for discovering resveratrol and NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide both available in health food shops online, as treatments that slow ageing in mice 
using the NAD plus energy and repair mechanism of cells. In 2019, there were phase one safety studies in healthy volunteers running at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and they were successful. In 2020, David Sinclair plans a clinical trial of pharmaceutical NMN in a disease area, probably a rare disease, but also in the elderly, to see if he can reproduce some of the results he's seen in mice in humans, such as increased blood flow and endurance. Now that the safety trials have been successful, the next step is testing how effective NMN is and what dose is required. Large numbers of people around the world have followed his research and are giving themselves a gram of resveratrol and a gram of NMN every day because that's what David Sinclair takes, despite the fact that the clinical trials haven't yet proved that it works in humans or how much the dose should be. David Sinclair and Andrea LaPlante, as interviewed on Diffusion last year, have co-written the book Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, where David details both his lab research and his personal anti-aging experiment with the doses he takes of NMN, resveratrol and metformin. I'll put a link in the show notes. In interviews and talks, David Sinclair has complained about how difficult it is to get anti-aging drug research funded and approved. Because people live a long time, so it's a very slow process to show you've affected their ageing, and there's controversy over whether ageing is a disease or not. He said, Right now, because ageing is not a condition that's agreed upon by any regulator, drugs that may slow or reverse ageing and perhaps extend lifespan healthy lifespan for many years, doctors are very hesitant to prescribe those medicines. This makes his use of the drug to heal otherwise unrepairable injuries, and perhaps rare diseases, a brilliant move, quite separately to the wonder of restoring sight to people suffering glaucoma. The papers from David Sinclair's labs were titled Erosion of the Epigenetic Landscape and Loss of Cellular Identity as a Cause of Aging in Mammals and Reversal of Aging and injury-induced vision loss by TET-dependent epigenetic reprogramming, and were published on the BioArchive preprints. The problem that many longevity researchers face is that many treatments that work in mice don't always work in humans. While we wait for David Sinclair's human trials to help people with glaucoma regain their sight, let's not forget that we now have a way to rejuvenate mice with limits as yet untested. Can we rejuvenate them every time they get old, without harm? In what ways are rejuvenated mice different to young mice? The forever mice may take over the world. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. The Fresh Science Bright Sparks Challenge continues. Sarah Brooker from Science in Public encourages early career scientists to find the story in their science and get it out to the public. She gives them media training and experience being interviewed on radio and TV before they all retire to the pub to get out the sparklers. The Bright Spark Challenge is for these scientists to explain their research in simple English in the time it takes a sparkler to burn down. You'll hear about treating tuberculosis with aspirin, electric car batteries and whooping cough. Foad, where are you? Yeah, Fouad, come on forward. Fouad is from Macquarie University. Hello, I am Fouad from Macquarie University. You probably are thinking to change your car with electric vehicle, but probably you are worried about having a flat battery at the middle of nowhere. In Macquarie University, we designed and built the prototype of, a, of an intelligent uh, electric vehicle charger. 
And our electric vehicle charger enables you to get charging battery from another vehicle, so you can get char charging battery from your friend if he has electric car, if, she, if or she has electric car. And another thing, actually, you can uh, connect the electric vehicle, the vehicle to your home and charge it using our charging system. Thank you. So what does your device look like? Is it just like a charging cable, like an extra mobile phone cable? Our device actually at the moment is at the laboratory version, but it's like this table, but it will be a smaller when uh, we, are, we are modifying that one and make it industrial version. And it will be located inside the car. So you just need to connect the cable between your car and another car. And it's like a plug and play then the charging power will be automatically flowing from another EV to your EV or vice versa. So you've got a prototype that's going to solve a few problems. I mean, is this such a big problem? It's only for those that have electric vehicles. I don't have an electric vehicle yet. Uh, one of the reasons that you don't have electric vehicle is that this is the main concern, actually, because I was thinking to change my car with electric vehicle, but I was thinking at the moment we don't have enough number of public charging station. So what to do? Actually, this would be a solution for that. It can pave the way for EV market. And another thing, it can convince the energy providers to uh, use electric vehicles because they are very worried about uh, the system. If, for example, 1,000 or 1 million electric vehicles will be connected to the grid, the energy providers will be worried suddenly the grid will become crashed, like it happened actually a few years ago in South Australia. It was not because of electric vehicle. The same thing might be happening because of electric vehicle in the future. Why hasn't someone created this before? How are you the first? What have you done that's different? We are not the first, actually, because electric vehicle market has many challenges. This is one of the, those challenges. Many universities are working on solving the problems. We solved one problem that no one has addressed before. So you've solved the problem. Is it going to be sold, what, next week, next year? What's the next step? We need money, actually. <laughs> we need a supporter, or we need someone to help us improve our prototype to make it industrial version. A after that, we can approach the EV manufacturers, electric vehicle manufacturers, to convince them to use our prototype. Hopefully, we will get this, this, this target. Thank you very much. Our next bright spark for the evening is Eleanor Hortel. Eleanor is from the Centenary Institute. Hi, everyone. My research has shown that the cells in your body which form blood clots can actually help tuberculosis to grow. And what this means is that regular old aspirin, which we all have in our medicine cabinets, could be used to treat the world's deadliest infection, which kills around 2 million people every year. So I've shown that this works really well in a zebrafish model of tuberculosis, but what's really exciting is since my study was published, other researchers have started looking in humans and the signs are really promising that it will work in people as well. So I've got a bit of time. I'd like to thank Centenary and everyone for coming out. Have you given zebrafish aspro? Have you just like thrown in a couple of aspro tablets into their fish tank? Yeah, so we take um, baby zebrafish and we take a bacteria which is really closely related to human tuberculosis. It's basically, basically fish tuberculosis. And we give that to the fish and then we also put aspirin and other drugs that are similar to aspirin into the water and then just see if that helps the fish or, or not. How do you measure whether a fish has TB or not? Like, how do you take its temperature? Is it vomiting? Is it sick? So we get this question all the time because the, the symptom that people know of tuberculosis is that people are coughing and obviously a fish doesn't have lungs and a fish can't cough. But the great thing about zebrafish when they're very tiny is that they're transparent. And so what that means is we can infect them with a fluorescent bacteria that like glows in the dark essentially and then we can just put the fish underneath a microscope and take a picture and see how much bacteria is there. Wow, so you've infected them with a TB-like bacteria, and then you've given them aspirin, and what did you see? 
We saw that in the fish that we gave the aspirin to, the bacteria grew half as well. So that means that there's half the amount of bacteria in the drug-treated fish than in the other ones. So should we just start treating people with TB, with Aspro right now? It's really tempting to say that because we all know aspirin is safe and it's cheap, which is what, exactly what you would want from a drug to um, treat a disease that really predominantly affects the developing world. We know that aspirin is safe the way that we normally take it. What we don't know yet is whether or not aspirin is safe to take when you have tuberculosis and in conjunction with other anti-tuberculosis drugs. So before we jump ahead of ourselves and start immediately giving it to people with TB, we do need to conduct a human trial to see if all of the rest of that is going to be safe. So how long does it take to go from zebrafish into humans? That's a bit of a jump because zebrafish are a bit distant to me. They don't even have lungs. That's true. The reason we use zebrafish is even though they look very different to us, but evolutionarily speaking, they're not that different and their immune system is actually really similar to ours. So it's not that big of a leap to take discoveries that we've found in a zebrafish and take them straight into humans. The interesting thing is that zebrafish is quite new as an experimental model, so oftentimes people feel a little bit more comfortable if we do a mouse study first and then take it into humans. But because a drug like aspirin is already shown to be quite safe in people, you could go straight into a human trial. Why did you think of giving aspirin to zebrafish in the first place? We know that people who have tuberculosis have a big increase in the amount of platelets that they have in circulation. So platelets are these cells which help to form blood clots. And that's been known for a long time that people who have tuberculosis have this increase in platelets and an increased risk of forming blood clots because of that. So the idea that we had was to say, well, if there's this big increase in platelets, is that something that maybe the bacteria is driving and something that bacteria wants to happen and if so maybe if we used antiplatelet drugs which is what aspirin is maybe that would help thank you very much eleanor thank you <laughs> lawrence come on down lawrence lou what I like to hear, support for science and scientists. Well done, Lawrence. So, Lawrence, you're from the University of New South Wales. Whooping cough is no ordinary cough. It is a very deadly disease, especially in babies. Over the last 10 years, the number of whooping cough cases has increased, and now we know why. My research has found for the first time that whooping cough has evolved to, into a superbug that can acquire more nutrients in our body and hide from the immune system better. Whooping cough still kills over 195,000 people a year worldwide. And by understanding how whooping cough evolves, it will allow us to develop new vaccines that can target these new strains better. And thank you, Rating and my lab for supporting me. And you want to sub you? Yeah. So have we got a crisis on our hands? The number of whooping cough has increased by like tenfold over the last 10, 20 years. But good news is that the vaccine is still working in the short to medium term. It's just that like over the longer term, if the bacteria continues to evolve and if we do nothing, then it will become a crisis. Is it evolving because we're not vaccinating enough? So we're actually doing really well with vaccinations for whooping cough in most of the Sydney and or in most of Australia, there's just some pockets where a bit more improvement is better. But because the vaccine is working so well, that it just forces the bacteria to be able to have to evolve in order to survive, and that's just what it's doing. So we just need to stay, uh, continue to stay that one step ahead and continue to vaccinate as well. Otherwise, if we stop vaccinating, numbers would... So even though whooping cough has increased, it's still not at the level at it, as what it was 50 years ago when we didn't have vaccines. How did you find this? What made you think that it was evolving? So we've done uh, studies just like surveilling the... So we collect strains of whooping cough throughout like Australia and then we sort of type them. So we sort of see what proteins is it expressing and then what we've found is 
that the proteins that it was producing is uh, different to what the ones in the vaccine. And also we see in mice models that the bacteria not only does better when we vaccinate the mice, or the, new, the, the current strains do better, but also when we don't vaccinate the mice as well, the current strains are actually doing better than the previous strains that were circulating around. So that sort of gave us a clue that it's not just evolving against the vaccine, but also evolving to better survive in humans. Well done. Thank you very much, Lawrence. <laughs> Natalie, come on down. Natalie's also come with her genomics, genetic sequencing crowd in the corner. Thank you. Natalie is from the CSIRO. So many of you in the audience may be interested in your family history. You may have even used things like Ancestry.com to discover relatives. But what you might not know is that discovering relatives can also help you to discover new disease genes. And this is exactly what I am doing. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a devastating neurodegenerative disease that leads to death in five years with no treatment. Now most ALS patients have no known family history or no genetic causes of the disease. So what I'm doing is uncovering hidden relatives um, to, to help uncover new disease genes. To do this, I've developed a new software tool called Tribes and discovered 54 new hidden relatives as well as two new ALS disease genes. And to wrap up, Exploring your family history can be more than a curious endeavor, but also a life-saving one. Sorry, I went over time. We have become increasingly interested in exploring our family history, and there's a lot of those sort of ancestry things out there. What got you thinking about the connection between, you know, our, our ancestors and disease? Yeah, great question. So, as I said, most people who have ALS, they don't have, a, they don't have a family history of disease. But there is a very small proportion, about 5 to 10%, where there is some family history. And in those patients, we can track how the disease genes are inherited. But what we thought, our hypothesis was that a lot of these other patients do, in fact, have some family history, but they're just so distant that the individuals themselves didn't know that they were related to other people who had ALS. And that's actually what we've discovered using the software that I've developed. So does that mean perhaps in the future I could get tested to see if I've got a, a, you know, a gene from my great, 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 great aunt and that I'm more susceptible to a disease? Yeah, if you had your great aunt's genome sequence as well as your genome sequence, then sure. This is all based on genome sequence data. So, I mean, that's where it's heading, isn't it? I mean, you can pick up a, a genetic test from the pharmacy and get your genome tested. So let's jump forward five, ten years. What's that going to look like? Yeah, well, the, the statistic I like to use is that by 2025, genome sequence data will be bigger than YouTube, Twitter, and astronomy combined. So that's the biggest source of, the, of big data currently. So it's going to be explosion of genome data. Yeah, so it'll be prolific, and it'll be much easier than it is now to sort of explore relatives as well as, you know, and hopefully for researchers to identify new disease genes that way. And they will need your software. So what's so special about your software and did you name it? I did name it. Well, with some help from the team. Um, and what's so special? Well, it's, it's a lot more accurate at distant degrees. So the current, the current software that's out there, there is software out there, but it's really only accurate to sort of third degree. That's your grandparent. But it's there's no really existing tools that are accurate, sort of fifth, sixth, so great, great grandparents and beyond. It's hard to find, um, discover that accurately without using the, tool, the software I've developed. And who's going to want to use your software? Who are you going at? What's your market? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's quite versatile because it could be used, obviously, for discovering disease genes. So anyone working on heart disease, cancer, diabetes, all of these um, diseases could individuals could have family history of that they're not aware of. But beyond that, it could be used for things like forensics, so discovering relatives from forensic cases, or even to avoid intermarriage between cousins. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Natalie. Well done. Limericks and haikus from the Fresh Science Sparkler Sessions with Sarah Brooker from Science in Public next week. You can see photos of all this week's scientists on the website. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. 
Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate this show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2XXFM in Canberra. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed this show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Buy through my affiliate links at diffusionradio.com slash support. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography, collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.